Good afternoon. We'll, we'll, we'll jump, jump right in and uh, thrilled to be here. My name is Arnie Duncan and I'm lucky enough to be a small, small piece of Brookings and I get to play Oprah today, which is the easy job. And um, uh, this, this one's a big deal for me. And we're just going to basically give uh, Sari a chance to sort of walk through his life. And he's a, a young man, but has done more and seen more than most of us will do in a lifetime. And he and I got to know each other um, last summer when my family visited Jordan and was just unbelievably moved by his intelligence and leadership and what he's been through and what he's doing. And we'll get there. It's a crazy story, but he's now a freshman at Georgetown University here in town, which is just absolutely remarkable. And um, anyway, so I'll, I'll be, be quiet. I'll, I'll ask questions for a while. Do we have a timekeeper? I guess we'll... Do you have me on time? And so leave, you know, 15, 20 minutes at, at the end for the audience. So give me, give me a five-minute signal if you could. That'd be great. But um, so let's just sort of go back. We'll just go sort of walk right through your life. Uh, growing up as a young boy in Syria. Let's right. just start there. What was that like? And uh, what was normal? What would be very different for folks in this environment to think through? And we'll just sort of, walk, you know, take it a piece, step at a time. Perfect. Well, thank you all uh, for inviting me here. Thank you for Brookings. Um, you know, I never thought, uh, honestly, if you asked me like four months ago of what is Brookings Institute, <laughs> I'd be like, I have no idea. <laughs> I didn't if know you, either not too long ago. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you asked me uh, four years ago, what is Georgetown, I'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, thank you all. Um, you know, I mentioned this in my short bio, but really the, you know, the, Probably the strongest memory that I have from living in Syria is when my dad, who was a tough man, you know, not only with me, with my siblings, with my mom and everything, um, decided to remove me out of uh, private school where he enrolled uh, my siblings and uh, he sent me to public school. And, uh, you know, to him, and I'm quoting him here is, you know, he, he's like, private, you know, private school is not going to benefit you with anything. I'm going to put you in public school so you know where everyone goes to school. So I did that, you know. But, you know, education was not, a, was not the important factor here. For my dad, uh, he had seen my, my brother go to university, and he saw the effect of university on my brother. And he's like, if uh, universities corrupt, uh, corrupt the mind. You know, you're going to be with me. You're going to go through the family business, which was like in agriculture, business, um, tourism. And he's like, you're going to do that. And, um, you, will, you know, you'll finish your elementary school, high school, but then you're out. And so uh, I kind of accepted that reality mainly because saying no to an Arab dad is a very hard thing to do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I accepted that reality and I just went on with it. But really at public school, um, all that we learned was really constituted by, uh, you know, our dear president on the, on the wall, you know, framed. And I, I remember I used to tell my friends, I was like, uh, you know, if anything, we would criticize the government in any way, he'd be like, shh, you know, black cars are going to come and take us, don't say anything about this. And we just kind of lived in that reality. Uh, but really what, you know, what affected me was seeing that, but simultaneously as well, going and experiencing life outside school. And that is during the summer, or during whenever my dad decided to be like, okay, this week is not important from school, come with me. Um, I would go, I would interact with people who are 20, 30 years older than me. I mean, um, it's kind of crazy that by the, by the age, by when I was 10 years old, I was, you know, stuffing pillows under me and driving a car, you know. Uh, at 12, um, I was arrested for driving because I was 12. You know, you're not supposed to be driving when you're 12. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, given how the situation is, um, I was able to go. I was able, they let me out of, you know, uh, the station. Um, I worked with people. I had a team that I was running responsible for at the age of 13. And, uh, you know, going back to school, I would tell my friend these things, these things and they wouldn't believe it. And so that really ha had a great effect on me. And, you know, my dad would always remind me, he's like, um, he, he had this quote, which, you know, first, when you first hear it, it's kind of crazy. But then as I continue reflecting on it, it makes sense, which is he's like, uh, if you give a book to, uh, 
And he would say it in you know, his Arabic accent and everything. Is if, if you give a book to a donkey, the donkey will learn the content of the book for, uh, uh, you know, in 10 years or 20 years. Eventually, it will learn, learn, it, learn it. But if you throw a donkey in life, the donkey won't know to do anything. And he's like, I want, I want you to be someone who can maneuver through life. And so I was like, all right. Um, and that, you know, continued until ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Continued until ninth grade when uh, uh, in ninth grade I finished and the Arab Spring started happening. I started uh, looking at the revolutions in uh, Tunisia, in Egypt, and I started looking at seeing all these young people uh, really, you know, fighting for their rights. Uh, the spread of social media. Uh, my siblings became very interested, would listen to revolutionary songs all the time, calling for freedom, calling for democracy. And uh, none of us really imagined that this would come to Syria um, until the day it did. And talk about, before we'll get there in one sec, talk about the reality of set of bodies on cabs being driven around to send a message. Like, what was it like to live under a daddy Assad? Yeah, um, Daddy Assad, you know, and these stories are from my mom and my dad, uh, the things they've witnessed, whether, um, and they were, they were the, you know, the old generation, very afraid, very against the, you know, the revolution or anything that would, you know, change the status quo. And uh, one of the things I remember uh, hearing from whether my mom or our cousins is back in the 80s, um, they would tie, you know, um, people to tanks and would drag them in the street as a reminder. Uh, this is what happens when you revolt against the Assad regime. Uh, my cousin, um, you know, my dad's cousin served in the military and was in Hama at the time, you know, in the uprising in the 80s. And uh, he saw it in his eyes how instead of executing people with guns, they would nail them to the head standing in a row. And uh, to me, you know, I'm, I'm listening at these, I'm seeing these things and I'm like, you know, you guys can't see that we have someone who might be a bad guy from these things. And um, yeah, so these are, these are the stories that we grew up, um, you know, hearing and living under, you know, in Syria. And you grew up fast, had a lot of responsibility. You run a team of guys early, grew up hard, but not crazy. And then at least from my perspective, sort of everything changed when you were 15. Yeah. <laughs> with the Arab Spring. and. T and I just want you to take your time and walk through two radically different or radically crazy experiences. And sort of walk through leading up to that, what happened. Let's just take one at a time and just go, go slow through it. So after I finished uh, freshman year at high school, um, I dropped out of school. And mainly first because my school ter was turned into a military base. Second of all, my dad found it as a perfect opportunity to be like, okay, no more school, it's too dangerous. Um, and so I was, you know, I was, I was still working, but first of all, I was, you know, I was separated my friends. I was now, you know, I had much more time to involve myself into the uprising, uh, witnessing demonstrations, uh, participating in ones, um, you know, running away from the government forces. And, um, so I started, I had, I started developing ideas and I wanted to express them. And so I, start, I went to Facebook and started writing my, my, writing my ideas on Facebook. I turned to photography mainly because I felt I was very suppressed, you know, with, with, the, with what's happening in the country. And uh, I felt that I'm slowly slipping away into, you know, depression and I wanted a way, you know, an outlet to express myself. And so I went to photography, started doing some photography. And, you know, when I say doing photography, don't think very fancy. Small phone, just, you know, really bad pictures of flowers and stuff. But to me, it meant something. And um, until one day uh, uh, on Friday, and Fridays uh, in Syria were known to be uh, the big thing, especially at the beginning of the revolution, because every Friday was called something different, and it represented something different for the revolution. And uh, one Friday, my cousin and I went to the mosque for Friday prayers, and after we got out, we were in the old city of Aleppo, uh, old section. And uh, we just pulled out our phones and started taking pictures. And um, five minutes later, we were picked up by Shabihas, which were you know, mercenaries by the Syrian government who were paid for every person they brought in. Um, next thing you know, uh, on spot, they accused us of working with foreign news agencies. Foreign news agencies at the beginning of the revolutions were not allowed to enter the country. 
uh, as you know, and um, they took us to the military intelligence in Aleppo. We, we happened to be lucky to be the first people to arrive that day, and they just, you know, they were ready for us. They threw us on the floor, started beating us immediately. Regardless of our, you know, of our age, I was 15, my cousin was in his 20s. Regardless of our age, he started beating us immediately and then stand against the wall. Um, uh, we gave in our belongings down to our shoelaces. And, um, you know, I remember this guy going into the room, um, you know, with a water pipe. And he's like insulting us directly. And after he told, after the guy, you know, in the room told him that we're accused of working with foreign news agencies, the guy takes out his pipe and starts beating us on the back, on our heads, uh, right away. And so I knew that at the time, you know, it's a matter of life or death. So I extend my hand to my cousin, standing to my left, and I grab it, and I'm like, um, it was great meeting you, we're probably going to die soon, or never be let out of this place. Because I had friends, I knew people who were captured by the Syrian regime, captured by the Syrian intelligence, and did not return. And, you know, to give you some context in terms of the intelligence in Syria, uh, really, if you're in, you're dead, and you, if you're out of there, you're, re, you know, you're reborn. And so, going in, I did not know if we're walking out of this at all. And it was important to me to make peace with myself, with my cousin, and to really end this the right way. Um, so we did, and we, he kept beating us until they discovered on our Syrian IDs that I happened, you know, to be born in Canada. And my cousin has a British nationality. And immediately, he's like, stop, 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 stop. Don't hit, it. hit them. And um, the treatment changed 180 degrees. Now uh, he's like, oh, we're very sorry. We deeply apologize for doing this. And um, a guy comes from upstairs, and he's like, uh, you guys are coming with me. And uh, once the, one uh, level of stairs, and we're up there, investigation. Now the narrative changed again. It's like, for me, they're like, you stand in this style. It was about this big. And they're like, if you move out of this style, if you sit down, if you say anything, we're going to kill you. And my cousin, they asked him to do the same thing at the end of the hallway. Um, you know, going to the investig investigation, this is a long story that I'm going to try and... You know, no, no, take your time. Yeah. Um, the first thing I remember him telling me was, uh, I entered the room. And it, the room, just, you know, still that picture of the room, half gray, half white. Uh, frame of the president on the wall. Uh, he's sitting there behind his table, lit on a cigarette, and looks at me and he's like, um, and I'm, I'm there shivering, I'm hearing people being tortured downstairs. Um, he lit on his cigarette and he's like, tell me everything or I'll put you in a place where even God won't know where you are. And to me it was at that moment I recognized that I either, you know, I am weak in front of him, and he can take advantage of that weakness, or I show him that I'm actually strong in front of him. And so I, I look at him, and I'm like, do you want me to tell you the truth, or do you want me to tell you something that will make you happy? Because these two things are completely different. Um, and the guy goes like, tell me everything. And so one of the things that came up was, you know, he asked me this. Uh, he's like, are you against the government? And I was like, for you, what does the government mean? And he is like, I'm asking you, are you against the, you know, the regime? And I'm like, are you talking about the president or are you talking about the, you know, the government as a whole? And he is like, he's like, you tell me. And I'm like, well, and you know, it's probably not the right decision to be in a, a, the Syrian military intelligence and be like you're against the regime. But I was like, you know, I don't know if I'm walking out of this. Might as well just tell him the full story. So I was like, you know, I. I'm against the regime. And he's like, you dare tell me this here? And I'm like, you wanted the truth. And so I'm like, but before you judge me, let me tell you why I'm against the regime. I'm like, when you work in agriculture and you have your you know, plants to farm and you have an official letter to go get your diesel uh, from the gas station and you go there and you get bullied and you get hit and you get threatened uh, you know, with guns and you go to the military who are, you know, just 100 meters away from you, and you ask them for their, uh, for their protection, they look at you and they tell you, it's not our problem, it's yours. I was like, would you be with the government or against the government, my, uh, from my point of view? I was like, I, I thought that the government is there, you know, to work for the people, to protect the people, but, you know, as a citizen, I did not see that. Um, 
he then, you know, they printed out my entire Facebook, uh, Facebook wall. And uh, uh, I tried to act smart and be like, uh, someone is stealing my identity on Facebook. That didn't go well. He held my head, banged it against the table. And I was like, all right, this is my username and password. And my cousin, he was telling me this later after we went out. He's like, because they took my cousin up with them to the computer room. And he's like, he's like, I've never seen in my life a scroll on the Facebook username section. And he's like, when we, they wrote the, our username, a scroll, they, like there's a scroll, and it was really tiny. You know that there are a lot of people that have been through this. Printed out my entire Facebook profile and highlighted everything you know, that was in opposition to the government. But I intentionally did not write anything that was opposing to the government uh, directly. Uh, I mean, all of them were statements uh, that you can interpret against the government, but nothing was direct. And one of them I still remember was uh, a chant we used to do in demonstration, which is, whoever kills his people is a traitor. And he comes to me and he's like, here you are uh, claiming that our president is a traitor. And I was like, I am not claiming our president is a traitor, no. I was like, what does it say? And, and he's like, whoever kills his people is a traitor. And I'm like, so you think that the president is killing his people, right? And that's why he's a traitor? And he's like, no, 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 I didn't say that. You said it. I was like, no, I didn't say it. I said whoever kills his people is a traitor. And, uh, and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, whoever picks up a gun, you know, and shoot a Syrian, shoots at another person who also is a Syrian, regardless of who they are, is a traitor, right or wrong? And he's like, right. I'm like, so why are you think I'm, you know, going against the government or against the president? I'm not doing that. So this goes on. One of the funny things is they found a picture of freedom on my phone and they asked me, they're like, where is this from? And I'm like, uh, Google. And he looks at the guy scribing this next to him and he's like, um, who's Google? <laughs> and he, he looks at me and he's like, who's Google? And I'm like, uh, Google, it's just a search engine. And he's like, he looks at the guy next to him, he's like, we should block Google. <laughs> <laughs> And was, this was at a time when, like, Facebook was just unblocked, like, uh, one year, one year and a half. Uh, Facebook officially became unblocked in Syria in 2010. Uh, so we're, we're talking, you know, uh, 2012. It's not such a lo long time ago. Anyway, uh, you know, for me, they let me out. Um, I had to sign. At the end, they told, uh, when we were going out, they, uh, they looked at me and my cousin, and they're like, the guy who's 15 years old had caused more trouble than the 20-year-old. And they let us out. And when I was leaving, they're like, uh, we're, we're going to keep an eye on you. And I was like, all right. Um, obviously, I had to delete everything off my Facebook at the time. Uh, thank God they didn't ask for my Twitter. Uh, <laughs> that would have been a disaster. <laughs> and uh, I went out. And the reason why I went out is because of being born in Canada, you know, because having that pri privilege. And walking out of that place, I was like, all right, I had the privilege of being born in Canada and being let out of the Syrian intelligence, but what about the thousands of others who, are, who were detained and are still detained in the intelligence right now, who don't have a foreign nationalities that can save them? And to me, that was you know, a reminder that I survived this and there's a reason behind it. But then not long, not long afterwards, a month later, uh, I was kidnapped by the Free Syrian Army. Um, my dad wakes me up in the morning. He's like, we're going to our farm outside Aleppo, uh, like 100 kilometers. And he's like, you're coming with me. And I'm like, all right. Uh, we go there, uh, middle, of the, middle of the day, an armed car drives into uh, our place. They ask my dad for the car, and he refuses. And because he's like, the car is registered under my name, so if I give you the car, anything you do with it is going to go back to me. Um, Immediately, they look at me and they like take a son. Uh, they pick me up, uh, handcuff me, throw me in the back of their pickup, which was like filled with, uh, you know, bombs, uh, AK-47s, rifles, all you can think of. Uh, they take our car as well. And at that moment, when I'm, you know, I'm laying in the back of the pickup, uh, my dad comes to me, um, and I, he's in his 70s. He looks at me and. He's crying. Now he's begging them now to take him instead of me or just take the car and let the guy go away. Let me go away. And they promise him that, and these, we're talking about people who are, you know, 24, 25 max. And they look at him, they're like, yeah, yeah we promise you we're going to let him off. Um, 
and I needed at the moment to say something to my dad to ensure him that, you know, whether I return or not, it's going to be all right. And I look at him and I'm like, Dad, um, you know, I will come back. But if I don't come back, please forgive me. Um, and they, you know, we continue driving. You know, pretty early in the drive, I realized that we're not going, at, they're not going to let me out anyway. And uh, we arrive to our first location. Uh, 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 they take me in. And trust me, uh, that was probably the first time where I looked at the wall and it was very interesting for an extended period of time. And a guy comes in, you know, very tall, uh, orange shirt, black pants, uh, heavily bearded, bald, sits next to me. He looks at me and he's like, uh, we kidnapped you. And I honestly start laughing and I'm like, yes, I know you kidnapped me. <laughs> and he's like, we kidnapped you and we're going to ask your parents for $2 million. Your dad works with the Syrian government. He supports them with, uh, with guns. Uh, he appears on national TV occasionally, which was all wrong. And they're like, um, $2 million. You're not walking out of here without it or you're going back home in a plastic bag. And so I'm like, uh, you're probably going to have to kill me pretty early because there's no way they're going to be able to provide you with $2 million. Uh, and he leaves. And the guy standing at the door, guarding the door, comes in afterwards, and he's like, are you crazy, Saria? And I'm like, uh, no, not really. Why? And he's like, the guy you just sat with beheaded nine people, and you were going to be number 10. Uh, and you were there laughing. And I'm like, yes, he beheaded nine people, but I still don't see you know, why I should be that afraid of him. Uh, and telling him what I really think. Um, you know, the first, the first few days I got to know the people who were responsible for me for. Um, and for me, I would always ask them questions. You know, uh, they got annoyed to a point where how much questions I asked about themselves, about what they used to do. Uh, one of them used to go to university. Uh, another was uh, a defect of the Syrian military. And these two, they, they're really interesting stories for me, and they stuck with me because one of them was university students. And I asked him, why did you join? And he's like, um, you know, I, I used to go on demonstrations uh, with a peaceful you know, resistance and everything. But when I, when I was standing there and I, you know, I held one of my friends dying between my arms after he was shot by the regime, I, I was fed up with this. And I wanted to pick up the guns and I wanted to shoot back. Uh, the guy who was a defect from the military, I asked him, why, uh, why did you join the Free Syrian Army? Uh, and he's like, I was, work I was in Homs, stationed in Homs, and they asked me to, sta to, I was a sniper, and they asked me to position myself on top of one of the buildings and shoot whoever uh, was going, who's, whoever is walking. Um, a man, a child, a woman, a pregnant, uh, a pregnant lady, no matter who it is, you shoot them. And he's like, I could not do that, but I joined them. And he's like, they're like, uh, please understand that while we're here and while we're part of the Free Syrian Army, we are still soldiers being given, uh, given orders. And to me, that was eye-opening because uh, especially now you see, um, you know, whether... Uh, while the Syrian regime talks about the Free Syrian Army, while the Free Syrian Army talks about this, you know, especially when it comes to down to the soldiers, at the end of the day, they're people given orders. And to me, it was important to see the humanity of these people and to really understand what they wanted. And when I asked them, what do you want, guys? And they're like, for this to end, for us to go back, open a small house, get married, have children, and that's it. And, uh, you know, we, we would joke about this when I was kidnapped, but they were like, you know, sorry, your dad are going to give us so much money. We're probably going to take part of that money and get married with it. <laughs> and I was like, please invite me to that wedding when you get, you know, <laughs> get married, if, if I go out. Um, you know, but, you know, the crazy, th the crazy things that happened uh, was, for example, one night when, so one of them, was called Rad, and that translates literally into twilight. And the guy asked me if I if I would take him as a brother. And you know, it's crazy to take someone who just kidnapped you as a brother. Uh, and I was aware of that, but I was so vulnerable that I wanted someone, uh, and I, I, I accepted him as a brother. And one day, I was by myself in the room. He walks into the room, uh, has a rifle with him, sits down next to me, and he's like, "Have you ever held a rifle before?" And I was like, "You know, fortunately not." And he's like, well, I'm going to teach you how to put a rifle apart today. I'm going to shoot, teach you how to shoot. And I was like, okay. So uh, 
he teaches me how to put the rifle apart, how to hold it, and now the rifle is in my hand. And he's sitting next to me. Um, he's unarmed. And in this situation, the you know the shift of power is with the person who's you know uh, kidnapped, and the kidnapper is there unarmed. And I hold that AK-47 and I throw it back at him. And he looks at me and he's like, "What did you do?" And I'm like, "This is the thing that ruined our revolution." And I was like, "This is not what I stand for." I was like, "If we're gonna hold." Uh, the revolution that we've, you know, wanted from the beginning. This is not the one. Uh, not we don't fight it with guns. I was like, it's not necessarily that I want to kill everyone who has a different opinion than I do. I was like, I'll sit, I'll listen, regardless of what your perspective is. I will listen. To, I will listen to you. And he's like, who taught you this? I was like, no one. It's part of being human. And uh, it turns out that it was a trick. They wanted to test me. If you know, they wanted to test. Uh, uh, test me and uh, before entering the room he took out the pin of the rifle which is the most important part of the rifle that shoots the bullet out and he's like if you had done anything people were standing outside ready to shoot you I would have taken you out immediately um, and one of another incident was perhaps when um, uh, one of them came at night very uh, uh, he was very angry uh, we, what happened at the night is that there was a lot of shelling in the area and they attributed that shelling and that fight that my dad had sent the military you know, to save me. And I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, guys, he did not do that. And um, a guy comes at night, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning, going crazy. And he's like, it's all because of you. It's all because of your father. He sent the military. We lost a lot of good men. And he asked me to sit in the corner, brought a flashlight and lit it in my face until uh, the sun rose. I was practically blind by the time he finished. And then he sat me down and he's like, sorry, you know, I'm a heavy smoker. And he pulls out two cigarettes, places them next to each other. And he's like, if you pick this one, uh, we will reinvestigate your story. But if it turns out that whatever we have against you is right, we will not kill you first, but kill your family, your friends, everyone you love in front of you, and then kill you. If you pick the other one, um, you confess, we let you out, we go get your father, and we bring him. And for me, I knew that um, I can't pick any of these two. And so for the next three hours or so, I looked at him and I was like, whatever you have against me is wrong. And the guy goes crazy, lifts me up from my hair. Uh, that's probably I lost some hair here. <laughs> uh, slaps me twice, punches me once, asks me to stand in the corner, uh, calls for the torture tools. And that was an ironic moment where the torture tools arrived and breakfast arrived with the torture tools as well. <laughs> One guy brought breakfast and the other brought torture tools. Um, both different guys and looking at each other, the guy who brought the breakfast goes in, looks at the guy who's ready to torture me, and he's like, what are you doing to Abu Sus? They gave me a title Abu Sus, which is father of Sus. And um, he's like, I'm going to torture him. And he's like, no, you can't do that. You can't, you know, uh, this is not how we do it. And so uh, they send the torture tools away. We sit down. Uh, they put the breakfast down on the floor. And uh, the two guys sit down and the guy who's going to torture me, and I'm still standing in the corner. And he's like, uh, the two guys asked me to come and join them for breakfast, but I don't respond until the guy who, asked, who was just going to torture me asks me to come and join him. And so I do. I go, I sit next to him. Um, and as I'm about to sip my tea, he holds my hand and he's like, slap me. And I was, I take it back, and I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and his face, I remember, turns, uh, turns red, probably as red as my face right now. Um, it turns red, and the other guys look at him, and he's like, sorry, uh, I tortured you all night. Please slap me so I can forgive myself. And I was like, I'm not going to slap you. So, I, you know, I was like, I forgive you. That's it. Uh, and afterwards, this guy, you know, became my other best friend there. And one day I woke up in the morning, he's wearing my shoes, jumping right, left, and sending. He's like, these shoes are so comfortable. Can I take them for the day? And I was like, yes, yeah, sure, take them for the day. Leave me something to, uh, uh, you know, to wear. But the next two incidents were really the ones that really opened my eyes. And please, here, uh, I don't want you to think that I was the, you know, the heroic person uh, going against them with all my strength all the time. Because at night, every day, I would sit and I would cry in the corner when everyone would be asleep. And I would pray to God. And I would, be, I, would be, I would say, 
please God, if this is uh, my time, let it be honorable. If not, give me the strength to fight against these people. And I understood. And kind of what gave me strength is that if I die in their hand, it will be such a strong message to show how the people who took an oath to protect the people have killed one of the people. And to me, that was an, a, a good enough cause to die for. And so one day, you know, when their general comes in the room, pretty angry, um, sits me down on my knees, um, my hands were free behind my back, uh, my eyes were blindfolded, takes out his gun and puts it right on my head. And he's like, are you going to confess or not? We're wasting time on you. And I was like, I've told you everything. Whatever you have against me is wrong. And he's like, all right. And... Uh, at the, at the time, I knew that I had to do something. You know, this is going to be so quick, whether I'm going to, like, it's a 50-50% chance. And so I take out my gun, I take out my hand, and I place it on his gun. And I'm like, shoot. And he's like, what? And I'm like, shoot. I'm like, if this bullet is meant to kill me, it will. But if not, I dare you to shoot. And uh, thankfully, he did not shoot. The guy takes out, you know, his gun, walks out of the room. And um, the, guy, the four guys that they're protecting me, they look at me and they're like, we kidnap people who are 30 and 40 years old and they're there, you know, begging, uh, begging, uh, begging us to not to kill them. And here you are, 15 year old, not giving a damn about life. And I told them the reason why I thought my death would be honorable if I died. But really the second time was the one that stuck with me the most, which is when they brought me a guy, old guy, sat down in front of me and started reciting verses from the Quran, cherry picked to whoever he wanted. Uh, he sits in front of me and I'm like, I'm going to respect you mainly because you're an old man, but whatever you're saying and the verses you're reciting are completely out of context, completely wrong. And saying that to an old guy who's completely an extremist sets him crazy. The guy stands up and he's like, chop his right arm and his left leg. And he walks out of the room and he's like, I want them in plastic bag and we're going to send them to his family. Uh, the guys are like, sorry, please tell them what they want. We don't want to do this to you. And I'm like, I will not. If you know this is meant to happen, it will. And this ideology of if something's meant to happen to me, good or bad, I really picked it up from my dad. Um, he, you know, two things that he taught me, never harm anyone. Um, and always believe that if anything's going to happen, uh, it will happen for a reason. And I took that. And that's why, you know, when I first came out of being kidnapped, I called him and I'm, and he's like, how are you? And I'm like, I'm good. And he's like, what happened? And I'm like, I, I applied everything you taught me. Um, but yeah, and uh, funny enough, when I was leaving, um, and you know, the negotiations between uh, the kidnappers and my brother, because my brother held the negotiations, were all recorded because my brother downloaded an app. So they were like part of a short documentary that we did. Um, uh, but what happened is when I was leaving, you know, my brother comes to the pickup uh, point and I, you know, go s see him, I give him a hug and I look at him and he's, he's like in a moment of shock. And I turn around and there are like these 20 guys standing saluting me. And I was like, uh, what is happening? And they're like, you have proven to be uh, stronger and more courageous than we can ever be. And um, they're like, we'd like to offer you a job to work with us. You never have to go into battle. You can order your office online for some weird reason. I found that weird. You can get you a car and you can start working with us. And I'm like, uh, no, thank you. I really want to go back you know, to school. Uh, and um, I gave them my number. I gave them my house number and they did call. <laughs> my mom picked up the phone. <laughs> She's, and they're like, oh, hi, where's Abu Suz? You know, we're looking for him uh, with his friends. We're in Aleppo now. Tell him we say hi. And um, I unfortunately wasn't there to pick up the phone, but I go into the room and my mom's like, there's this guy called Rad and this guy called Khal. They're like, you know, your friends. She's like, sorry, uh, who are these people? And I was like, oh, those are my kidnappers. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what happened? And she's like, <laughs> she sat down. She's like, oh, my God. Um, we didn't pay $2 million. We paid around... Uh, you know, $20,000, um, uh, but yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, these, you know, these two different differences in terms of uh, who I got taken by. And one question that I always get is, you know, who treated you better? And I was like, it's not really about who treated me better. They both did something that's unethical, unmoral, uh, you know, unnormal, and that is they kidnapped someone who's 15 years old. Um, and it's not about who treated me right or wrong. 
but it's really about what I had to learn from these two experiences. And going back to my house, you know, I was shocked, my family was shocked that I was, you know, just like con continuing my daily life after, like, the uh, next day. And I asked myself repeatedly since then of how I'm not traumatized. And um, I still don't know why. Yeah. And uh, that, so these are the two things that stay with me. The experience with the kidnapping and being detained are much longer, but I want to go into questions. <laughs> well, a few minutes, a couple of things. So that was 15. What age did you go to Jordan? So at 17, um, so after returning from being kidnapped, um, you know, the borders were, you know, closing in. We could not leave anywhere outside of Aleppo. The situation is too dangerous. Um, you know, we lost, we lost all our part, uh, our properties, all our businesses. And my dad is like, I'm not sitting at home doing nothing. And, uh, and so he's like, I'm going to teach you how to make yogurt and we're going to start selling yogurt. And I was like, we are, guess I guess we're making yogurt and selling yogurt. And so I was making yogurt around like 150, 200 buckets a day. And not because I love yogurt, but because it was a profession. And I, you know, went on with it. But at the same time, you know, um, I realized that I don't want to spend the rest of my life um, uh, making yogurt. One, not that there's anything wrong in making yogurt, but that's not what I want to do. Second of all, I want to participate in the building of my country in the future. And right now, I am on the margins of, you know, I can't do that without an education. Um, you know, Jordan was an option because I had two of my siblings. They went there. They, they started from the beginning. And uh, I wanted to take the decision of going to Jordan. Now, my dad, would, this is something I, I just recently started sharing in my talks, mainly because, you know, of how personal it is, told me, he's like, if you ever decide and leave Syria, I will disown you as my son. Um, and to me, that, that was the gamble. You know, this is, there's this guy that, you know, taught me everything uh, since I was, uh, since day one. And um, at the same time, there's my life. And what do I choose? Um, and to me, you know, I went to my mom and I went to my sister. She was also there in Aleppo. And I was like, I, I want to go to Jordan and I want to, you know, continue my education there. And um, they supported me. And, uh, you know, I had, I had to lie to my dad. I, I told him, you know, he, things, you know, we fixed things. We became friends afterwards and he passed away. And luckily I was there for him. But, you know, one day I was like, yeah, I'll come see you at this time. But at this time I was packing my bags and I was, you know, taking down official borders and out of, my, out of, out of Syria. Um, no support, nothing at all. And uh, I knew that that's the first step that's, I've, you know, taken life by my own hands. And I, I can't be a burden on my family and everything. And so um, November 2013, um, I was on my way out of Syria. And this is something that I did not include in my documentary, mainly because of legality. But I actually had to leave Syria through, on the, the, through the unofficial borders, uh, through Turkey. And... Um, as I was taking the unofficial borders, I was taking by Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the less extreme version of ISIS. And uh, the first thing, uh, walking into a crowd, um, a guy comes behind me, places his hand behind my back, and I turn around, dressed in military uniform from top to bottom, and I'm like, the third time is the time. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> and he's like, he takes me, and um, I go into a room. There's two, these two guys, and the first thing they say is like, chop off his head. And there I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I start speaking in Arabic, and I'm telling them, I'm like, guys, I'm just going to visit relatives outside your borders. I'll come back. You know, uh, there's no need to chopping anyone's head here. Uh, and then they're like, they throw me, in a, throw me in a room for a couple of hours, and they're like, you're free to go. I arrived to Turkey, and Turkey's like, we can't let um, a Canadian citizen enter our borders unofficially. And I was like, guys, there's no going back. And uh, I was like, please call the embassy. And uh, they called the embassy. Ten minutes later, they're like, all right, you can go through. And I came to Jordan. And um, in Jordan, I, the, mo the first day I arrived, second day I was up looking for a job 
because all I had in my pocket was, uh, you know, three hundred dollars, and I knew that whatever my my mom has on her, whatever my sister has on her, it's there, and for me, it's it's a it's a new life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Take a minute and just walk through a little bit of what we did last summer, family visited, the refugee camp, just so folks get a sense for the reality of other Syrian refugees in, in Jordan. So in Jordan, you know, uh, I'm just to tell you how I got involved in this, uh, you know, working around, working with Syrian refugees in Jordan. And that, so in Jordan, when I started working, um, I knew that at one point I have to, I came here for continuing my education. And so I started applying to schools in Jordan. And uh, all the schools that I applied to, private, mainly because I knew if I'm going to go into the public schools in Jordan, there's not going to be that great of a difference from the public schools in Syria. So all the private schools that I applied to in Jordan rejected me, until one of my coworkers happened to be a King's Academy alum. And, and she's like, hey, there's this place called King's Academy. You know, it's a pretty cool place. Why don't you look into it? And I was like, uh, sure. So I started looking into it, and um, I applied. Um, I applied and I came for the interview, and uh, it was uh, my headmaster is here, by the way, from King's Academy, which I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and uh, I applied there, and I got an interview, and they're like, "All right, take the acceptance test." I took the acceptance test. I get a phone call, and they're like, "Sorry, you failed." And I failed because um, I only started speaking English five years ago. And um, looking at the test, it was all, it was like, like factor this equation and do this and do that. And I'm like, what the hell do they want? And I, I failed. But then the guy, um, he's like, sorry, you failed, but we're willing to give you another chance next time. And so I go get books and, uh, from the same person who told me about the school and I start studying them. And um, I, do the ex uh, I familiarize myself with the language and I do the acceptance test another time. I get accepted, I'm given a uh, partial scholarship, uh, very generous scholarship, but at the same time, I still have uh, a, you know, a big amount to cover for the next three years. And at the time, you know, I was like, all right, the opportunity was right there, but now it's fading away. But at the, I was like, you know, I've gone through a lot of things in my life. You know, let me try and figure out right a way around this. And so I put a, together a GoFundMe campaign and, um, you know, it starts spreading on the internet. And I was, I really, you know, told the reason why I want to go to King's Academy. What do I feel like um, I have to offer? And the reason why I decided to go to King's and stay in the region and not go to Canada, because I had that option, is because I knew that the moment I step out of this, this region, I will become a foreigner. And I did not want to do that. And so I knew that King's is going to equip me with the tools I needed. And so I really fought for that place. And then three days into it, I received an, uh, an email. They're like, sorry, I would like to provide you the amount needed for the upcoming three years. And I remember the day I called the schools and in the school and they were screaming on the phone, not me. And they were screaming. They're like, oh, it's like, this is great. And uh, I go there and that's where I learned my English. That's where I learned, uh, you know, uh, the thoughts that, you know, the, the, that you observed and that other people observed. That's where you know, we started doing our NGO. Mm -hmm. But really where I started, you know, becoming involved in community service is uh, when I was rejected from basketball because I was too old to join the team. And, and they're like, you can't play against other schools. And I was like, um, there's this teacher at King's, her name is Miss Tessa. She's like, Saria, uh, come join community service. And I was like, all right, I joined. And I saw how they do it. And I was like, all right, uh, now I want to do something different. And I, uh, so my, two of my friends and I were taking this class called Capstone. We're doing a lot of research in terms of education, uh, you know, technology and everything. And we're like, and then we start looking into the situation of Syrian refugees in Jordan. And we realized that the international community is really observing the refugees living, you know, refugee camps. And that is important. But they're also, you know, marginalizing 80% of the urban refugees living in Jordan. And to us, that was a, a large population, a population that had no access to education, uh, healthcare, or basic life necessities. And um, we wanted to work with them. So we developed this, uh, the NGO and kept working for three years. But then when you, know, when you came, at the time, I was, what I was working on is 
but this is the summer before coming to Georgetown, is I wanted to really document the lives of urban refugees in Jordan, to go through the struggles they're living through. And so I did, I did my research uh, on the ground, went from one building to another to really find where they're you know, centered. And uh, I got to meet that one family, uh, Um Suleiman. And the first day I entered Um Suleiman's house, um, she lives on, in a room on top of the ro uh, of a roof, and you know you you saw it. Uh, she has six children. One of them is uh, her niece, uh, her nephew, who she adopted because uh, his parents died, were were killed by the regime. Um Suleiman's father, uh, husband, was killed by the regime as well, and she saw it in front of her eyes. And she's living on a roof, on in a room on top of a roof, paying. Um, you know, 50 JD uh, a month for, and that is around, uh, you know, 50 JD is around $80. Uh, you know, she gets 100 JD a month, and they charge her 50 JD for electricity, uh, water, and rent. And, you know, to pay 50 JD for one room on top of a roof uh, is absurd because a regular house pays between, you know, 30 to 50 JDs in Jordan. So this lady is being taken advantage of. Her children, you know, 12 and 13, uh, they work not for, you know, you know, five dollars, you know, an hour, but five dollars a day. And a day, and you saw when, you know, uh, we were sitting there and their, her children were like, um, you know, it's time for us to go to work. And um, it, it didn't only hit me, but, you know, it's, I think sitting there, you know, 13 and 12, going to work at 6 p.m. at night because they're afraid they might lose their job and they have no income to support their family. And, um, yeah, that I felt that these stories are being forgotten and that really people need to see them, need to hear them. Last question we should open up. Obviously, we could talk all day, but talk to me about the future of Syria and, and what, what do you want to do and is there a, is there a way for you to go home? Um, so I have five search warrants under my name in Syria, given that uh, I've skipped military service and the regime still thinks that I'm in Syria. Um, so there's no way of me going home anytime soon. Um, I wish I can go home. Every day I think about it. I close my eyes and I walk my way like in streets of Syria, but really um, in terms of future of Syria, sitting now seeing um, uh, people are saying, you know, situation is getting better. Um, and yes, the situation is getting better. But then again, if you look at it, why is the situation getting better? You know, homes, um, uh, you know, I was just reading the news uh, yesterday, areas on homes uh, are, you know, demolished. And people are not even allowed to go back. Um, my cousin works with the, you know, with an organization within Syria, and I asked him to really, you know, check on um, where's the funding coming from. And um, he's like, it's all Russian based. And so now, when we think of, you know, a situation is getting better, the, you know, you know, the government is taking control. It's not really the government taking control. It's, uh, it's Russia. It's, uh, you know. Uh, Iranian fighters, it's Hezbollah on the ground, they're taking control and Assad is really just, you know, uh, moving the way they like. And, uh, you know, not only that, uh, efforts of, uh, there are no efforts of bringing the refugees back. They tell them, yes, you're welcome to come back, but there's nothing to come back to. Um, be it Aleppo or other cities, um, the government would fix the road and then they would put a fence now um, and my mom was there recently, they would put a fence uh, next to the building that's demolished and they're like, don't come near this building, it might fall apart, but the street is fixed. And I'm like, guys, I mean, where do you start? Do you start with the street or do you start with the building that's gonna host people? Um, for me, what I really wanna, want, want to pursue you know, a life in is education. Because not only that I've seen the impact of education on myself, I've seen the impact of education on the students that we've worked with within my NGO, but um, really, uh, you know, going to King's changed my mind in terms of how we think of education. Uh, I didn't, 
I didn't want to go and receive an education where I have a degree, I put it on my wall and be like, hey, got a degree and I'm going to work in this. For me, I wanted to see pr different perspectives. Uh, I wanted to broaden my horizon. I wanted to understand, and that's mainly why we started this NGO, taking the skills that we learn in class, not necessarily the content, and giving it to students who have no access to it. Um, and see, also a way I think of it is, you know, a uh, large amount of Syrian refugees are scattered between Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. Um, in Jordan, they recently allowed Syrian refugees to be integrated into public, public school, but there's still a lot of work that goes into that in terms of who's teaching them, the timings, uh, the situation. You saw, you know, when you spoke with that uh, girl, the amount of racism they're receiving for being Syrian and being taught, you know, in one school. And we're not saying that they're all receiving racism, but there's still a long way to go. But the way I think about it is, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, and, you know, the average amount of years a refugee spends in a country is over 10 years. Uh, 10, uh, 15 years down the line, these refugees are going to be looked at. They're going to be blamed for, you know, uh, social tension, for poverty. And governments and politicians are going to be like, oh, look at, uh, look at how they ruined our country. But in fact, we're going to be pointing fingers at them, where in reality we should be pointing fingers at ourselves because we didn't integrate them properly from the beginning. You know, uh, and to me, that's an eye-opening, you know, factor. You know, education should be, you know, as important as food and shelter because people need it and it changes people's mind. Mm -hmm. Let's have a few minutes. Let's open it up. We can keep the questions brief and uh, take, take, take a couple questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Tom Bradley. I'm a grad student at George Mason University. I'd like to find out of the population of Syria, about a quarter of them are internally displaced, about a quarter of them are refugees in other countries. How many someday, 10, 15 years from now, do you think will return to Syria, <clears throat> excuse me, under what conditions and what will the government look like after Assad is dead? Thank you. So, uh, uh, should, should we pile up a couple of questions and we start? Just, yeah. uh, take, take this one and we'll take one or two more. So just go ahead. Yeah. Take so in terms of, you know, the people who are internally displaced, um, and when I was in Syria, I would see people coming in, living in schools, um, uh, living on the side of the streets, and we would go talk to them. Um, they want to go back to the areas they're coming from. And these people have started, you know, to go back, to, be, to, open, their, to open their shops, to open their houses, to re rebuild. But when your house is in a, in a building that was completely demolished, it becomes difficult to really figure out where you're going to go back. Uh, for those who are living in, you know, in uh, areas, let's say Jordan, and I'm going to speak of my experience in Jordan. You know, we went to the refugee camp together. We sat down. We spoke with people. And uh, I remember uh, one, one of the guys we spoke to, he told you that I will not go back until the Syrian regime uh, is out. Because, you know, I've lost member. A, I've lost members to Syrian regimes. It's just difficult to go back and see this person uh, still in power. Um, you know, again, uh, refugees in Lebanon are returning back to Syria, but there's still a lot who are staying in Lebanon and working there, because, mainly because they've opened, uh, they've started a life. And for them, moving back means changing that life. So it becomes difficult to really see, you know, they will go back. But then when they go back, what are they going back to? And how easy is it for them to go back? There's a lot of security measures, for example, in Homs and Aleppo, that doesn't allow a lot of people to come back, given that uh, whether they were against the government, whether they were captured once and then they f uh, flew, whether they had, you know, people like me who, have did, who escaped military service. Um, I can't just simply go back there. And so there's a lot of measures that should take place for, to allow people to show them that, you know, Syria ironically, is welcoming the Syrian people again. Uh, now we have that, uh, that idea of Syria not accepting the Syrian people, and simply because of a regime in place. Um, in terms of the, f uh, the future of the government there, you know, I'm not a political expert in terms of what's going to happen. We've all seen that Syria has been an example. Everyone thought that the regime is going to fall very soon, uh, very early. They didn't. And so the future of Syria, I don't know. I'm, I keep up with the, uh, with the Syrian regime's uh, news and everything, and uh, one thing that stuck with me, 
It reminds me a lot of uh, Cold War history is when, uh, you know, uh, Bashar al-Assad came out and he's like, when we're looking for investment, we're going to look east and we're not going to look west. And that says a lot about the politics that's going to take place in the country right now in terms of the interests, in terms of the proxy wars that are fought in the country. But I know for a fact that it is difficult when you lose a cousin, when you lose a, uh, a brother, when you lose a son to a regime, and then you come back and that regime is still in place. You wouldn't want to come back. Hi, my name is Scott Cooper. I'm a retired Marine, and now I work at Human Rights First. We're at kind of a unique moment in our own country where we're not exactly welcoming of refugees. I wonder if, if you could tell us about your own experience um, and if you felt welcome here in America. Um, you know, for me, there's just one thing that I find interesting. They tell you, you know, especially right now, they're like, everyone is learning Arabic because they want to come back to the Middle East and they want to understand the Middle East. I'm like, here I am, I understand English, and I come here and I have no idea what tax, tax reforms are, no idea what, you know, uh, health care is, and uh, no idea of what's happening right now. Uh, so uh, there's that one part. So for me, I have no thoughts in terms of uh, what's happening uh, in America, but I know for a fact that it is, and we talked about this in the room, that yesterday I had an assignment to read about the religious freedom and religious diversity in America and about by Professor Diana Ick from Harvard and about um, how amazing it is of the different diverse religions and uh, communities that have been affected by the American culture and are affecting American culture in positive ways in America. Um, and I found it extremely interesting uh, eye-opening that as I was reading this article, uh, I received a notification that says the Supreme Court uh, gives an okay to the recent tra travel ban. To me, I was like, uh, you, know, uh, it's a, you know, it's an interesting time to be alive. But I also know that, <laughs> I also know that, you know, there are signs, there are things like, you know, sharing Islamophobic videos you know, on social network, on Twitter, is not the right decision to do when you have people planning mass shootings in mosques. And yeah, th these things uh, are not right. And to me, I see that and I'm like, you know, I wonder what if, you know, uh, uh, third world dictators had Twitter account, what would they do? You know, and it's uh, every day, it's like something new. And so for me, I, I stay on the side, I look, uh, I go ask my American friends, I'm like, guys, can someone explain to me what's happening? And they're like, oh, we don't know. And I'm like, I'm like, where should I go? <laughs> where should I go to understand what's happening? I try to read news and uh, yeah, you, never, you never understand what's happening. And I'm like, all right, uh, as long, you know. And, and I've heard it. You know, you think that I wouldn't hear it in Georgetown, but first day of school, um, walking into the dorm, I hear a guy going like, I hope there's no Syrians in this dorm. And um, I ignore it. And uh, I walk into the dorm. It's, uh, but I know for a fact that if he came to me and he knew that I was Syrian, I would sit him down, even though if he's told me I'm a terrorist, even if he told me, uh, you know, um, anything he wants to say, I, knew, I know that I would sit with him and I would show him that I am not a terrorist. Um, that... You know, Islam is not really about chopping off heads and killing people. And, uh, you know, we really have uh, a rich history that is, you know, being ignored. Uh, one, two, and we'll probably have to close it then. So, yeah. final two questions. Um, hi, I'm Micah. Um, where do you think the extremism comes from, uh, extreme ideologies? You talked about the old man who is an extremist, where do you think the source of that is? You know, should we take the other question? Take, so yeah, we sure, take, so take that one too. So here, so. so actually there's not another question. I'm a Syrian refugee too. And um, uh, I have the same story view. Um, so thank you so much for sharing the story. Um, uh, so I have a question. I left the Syria when I was 17, um, almost two weeks to finish my high school. And then I get it in Turkey when I was um, like 20 or 21. And right now I'm trying so hard 
to find any school accept me to come mm. to just to continue my education. So can you please tell me what you did and mm. what you should to tell the American University how to accept more Syrian refugees? Mm. Thank you. Mm. It's a great one to close on. Thank you. Yep. Um, Take those two. For the extreme ideology, you know, the the idea and you know, I was actually for my class for my international relations. We're reading. Um, reading uh, different research in terms of, and, you know, theoretical research in terms of why uh, people choose an extreme ideology. But uh, for me, the way I look at it, and from, you know, my experience with these fighters and soldiers, and when I ask them, it's mainly when you're pushed in the corner cons uh, constantly, you will develop an extreme ideology because you will feel that the whole world is against you. Uh, one of my friends, um, she recently published a book. She was the journalist that uncovered the identity of Jihadi John, had gone to, you know, spoke with ISIS militants, spoke with ISIS uh, leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, she would go, whether it's Taliban, whether it's ISIS, and she would ask the militants, she's like, why did you decide to join us? And they would talk about how they grew up in Europe and they were marginalized by their com uh, by community. They had no one to belong to. And when these people came and offered something, it's um, a sense of belonging. And um, it creates that. And so when you have the whole world against you and you have uh, people, you know, building walls against you or people, will, you know, Recently, the BBC published uh, uh, the names of 33,000 immigrants that drowned on the shores of Europe. Um, you know, when you hear these things, it doesn't become a matter of, you know, of numbers. It's 33,000 people that died as they're trying to flee a war and go into Europe. And how do we think about that history? Where do we see it? And because that can be interpreted as a, as a reason why someone would turn and become an ex, you know an extremist. Um, in terms in terms of what's it called uh, the other question you know as I was applying to universities in the U.S. I had to withdraw my application from two universities. One of them was around the corner, uh, mainly because I didn't have thirty thousand dollars in my bank account. The, the two of them, yeah, I had to withdraw my application because I didn't have $30,000 in my bank account, even though I have shown that I am applying for financial aid. But, you know, Georgetown was willing to sit down um, and actually go through the process, and that's why I decided, you know, joining them. Um, I got, you know, I got rejected from all the other schools that applied to in the U.S. as well. And uh, whether it's because they were afraid of matters of, you know, uh, immigration or anything, but that happened. And I think, um, you know, recently I saw uh, President, President Obama's um, message to a, trans, a transgender uh, woman in India where he told her, you know, it's about knowing, it's about standing up, speaking, it's about formulating your story to create action. And uh, part of the reason why I decided to share my story is because I wanted to put a face to Syrian refugees. I wanted to show the world that if I was happened to be fortunate enough to, you know, uh, survive the incidents that I've gone through, others in the thousands have not. And so it's about, you know, sitting down, taking that story, putting it together, and uh, presenting it, and really showing them what you have to offer. Uh, applying to Georgetown, uh, you think that I, I wrote about uh, being kidnapped in my common app, but I really wrote about making uh, yogurt. And <laughs> I, I wrote about making yogurt, and the guy who sat for my interview, they was like, yogurt? <laughs> and I was like, I love it. And, and so, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, we'd sit, I'd, I'd love to, you know, if you live in D.C.? Yes, um, I, mean, connect, I practically connect. live in DC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would love to connect. Um, I, like I've spoken at many different schools that will be, you know, will be more than happy to have you. So we'll connect and, you know, hopefully make it happen with good people like Arnie and everyone else in the room. I mean, yeah. how how are you now? Um, uh, you know, I I'm, th I'm fantastic. Thanks so much. So how old? How old? How old? <laughs> oh, uh, it's, it's a good one. <laughs> I'm uh, 21 now. 
So uh, just, just yeah. Take a second, soak that in. It. it okay. Here, name, oh. name your nonprofit. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my profit is called Fikra Al Mashi, which means uh, idea on the go. We work on uh, providing uh, education through ter critical uh, student and community centered education through critical thinking, question generation, uh, brainstorming, uh, and project based learning to urban refugees between the ages of 15 to 25 in Jordan. I'm spending my, uh, I'm now, I'm monitoring the NGO from here, but every summer uh, my plan is to go back, work on the ground. And when people ask me, where do you see your NGO in the future? I'm like, hopefully closed, because we're in the 21st century and people are still not receiving education. That is just an absurd idea to sit down and contemplate. Um, yeah, I'm 21, year old, 21 years old, and uh, when my RA at Georgetown heard that he's, a, he's receiving a 21 year old in his hallway, he was really worried that I might be causing him trouble, but it turns out to be otherwise. <laughs> <You're not good. laughs> yeah. So I, I'm lucky enough to know lots of young people all over the country and remarkable people, but I don't say this lightly, I don't know a 20 year old, 21 year old as smart, as intelligent, as courageous, um, as humble, and as human as Sari. So please give him a huge round of applause. Thank you.